Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction, but more importantly, it's about recovery. And uh, we're back. This is the first podcast in 2024. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah. Now, you you came in and you said, I got some stuff we could talk about New Year's, but if you don't want to, I don't really care. But I, I think I think we should probably let you. <laughs> Did I sound that complacent? A little bit. A little bit yeah. yeah. Indifferent? Well, because I, I think people are indifferent when it comes to New Year's resolutions. Okay. Because it's the same yeah, old, true. same old song and dance. Well, the reason it's on my mind is people have brought it up to me all week. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you real quick. Okay. It'll help. Yeah. This is this is helpful advice, I think. First of all, people, it's good to have the desire to have a New Year's resolution. You want to improve yourself. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Problem is we do it the wrong way. We think of the resolution in an absolute and permanent way. Kind of like we do in all recovery. All or nothing. Yes. All or nothing. Yeah. Right? Or sobriety. Or sobriety. And so the problem with that is you 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 have this all or nothing mentality. It's permanent and it's pervasive. It's very rigid. And then I don't go to the gym one day or I drink Coke one day or whatever your resolution was. First crack in the dam. Yeah. And then you're just like, well, then I'll throw it all out. Right? Yeah. So I challenge people to not think of their resolutions that way, to think of them as experiments on a short-term basis that you can evaluate. So it might be, you know what? I'm not somebody who goes to the gym, but that's my New Year's resolution, if that's what somebody says. So instead of setting themselves up to fail with a rigid, permanent plan to go to the gym, they should say, how long do I think I could really go to the gym? Could I go for a week? Do I think I could make it one week or three days? or one day, but pick the amount of time you think you could honestly do. You should make all your goals attainable. Exactly. And then sit down with someone else and evaluate what that was like. Work the kinks out. Maybe you're going at the wrong time. Maybe you shouldn't go every day. Maybe you're doing too much. Whatever it is, keep experimenting with that goal and tweaking it at the end of your evaluation time. So maybe you think like, you know, I could go for a month to the gym. Okay. At the end of the month, sit down with a friend, somebody that you trust, and go over your experience with them and change things so that you can keep doing another month and then another month and then another month. Does that make sense? Well, so you yeah, keep because you're talking to an addict who says, take yeah. it one day at a time. Exactly. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and Z- same idea. Yeah. And that's, you know, you're talking about the gym and uh, I took some time off during the break too from the TV job. And my first day back was at a gym. It was the day after New Year's. Oh, yeah. And we were talking to, uh, you know, the, the the gym and right it was now probably it's packed, right? It's packed. It's yeah. the busiest time of year. And what he said is he goes, it's going to be busy until about the mid of February. And then yeah, about six weeks, right? Everybody will have their gym yeah. back. And I go, why is that? He goes, because people set themselves up for failure. Yep. You know, and if I learned anything from the Sigma Chi fraternity, which I was a member of. Yeah, I bet you, you learned a lot. If you failed to plan, you plan to fail. There you go. You know, and so you've got to make a goal that's attainable. And so it's, it's the guys who go back to the gym for the first week and they overexert themselves and they get sore and then they don't want to go back. Right. And so they try to do too much too quick. And so what they recommend is just go into the gym, get familiar with it, walk on the treadmill for 20 minutes, yeah. stretch a little bit, get your body used to it. If you've been sediment for all this time and you go back and all of a sudden you start moving, you're not going to be happy. Exactly. And so you've got to make it attainable i agree i think that's great advice for the gym especially and lots of things like if you're changing your eating habits or if you're somebody who's like i'm going to start reading books you know whatever your goal is uh make sure that it's attainable do it in short spurts warm up don't overdo it but i really like the idea of experiments experiment then you evaluate then you tweak it and then you experiment again well you know not to bring it back but this is a podcast about addiction and recovery mm-hmm. and that absolute is a mindset that goes hand in hand with addiction and recovery mm-hmm. and so many people where relapses do occur and and, and nobody wants to right. talk about it but it's a natural occurrence that happens in the recovery community and it's so much in fact that it's not just for the addict to learn but for the loved ones as well because if they get out and they're doing good and then they relapse so you're in recovery why do you think that that's that's so shameful people don't want to talk about their relapses why do you think that is well it reminds me of that thing the conversation i had with my mom about two months you know out of rehab and she was like hey casey you're doing so good i'm so glad we'll never have to do this again Mm -hmm. and i went "Mm." and she's like what do you mean Mm." and i was like well you want me to tell you that so you can feel better and sleep easy at night and i understand that 
And but, she wanted that for you, too. And she wanted right. it for me. I go, but I know the disease, and I know relapses occur. And they so much in the fact So how that, did you get that mindset? That's my point. Like, a lot of people, I think, in recovery have an absolute mindset. Like, it's all or nothing. And then when they do have a relapse, they feel ashamed about it. They don't tell anybody, which compounds the problem. But, and so did that's, somebody teach you that? Well, in rehab, you know, I, I was in rehab with people who had been to multiple rehabs, mm-hmm. people who had relapsed multiple times, and they said you don't have to go back to ground zero again. You can start to where you relapsed, and and because you still have the information, you still have the knowledge, but it's that shame that keeps people from talking because they don't want to hear the disappointment in their parents' voices. They they don't want to hear their employer say. Oh, man, we really thought it was going to happen this time because the addict really thought that they were going to do it this time, too. Yeah. But sometimes life is bigger than that and things happen. And I'm not condoning it, but it is a part of life and it's a part of addiction. But isn't it part of the learning process, I think? A hundred percent. And so a relapse can be a hiccup or it can be a disaster. Yeah. Right. And I think it all starts with your attitude about a relapse. Now, I've been fortunate enough and lucky enough to never have relapsed. Right. Um, and I, I, I'm as clean as I've ever been in my whole entire life. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I know that a relapse could occur and I try to be mindful of it. And I try to be smart about things that I do so much in the fact that we just had a conversation off air that me and the girlfriend went down to Wendover. Yep. And we were over. It's over. Wendover. Yeah. And we were down there and we were gambling and I'm the kind of guy that they hate to see at a 21 table because I order a Coca-Cola or a water. Yeah, And so when I order a Coca-Cola and it comes to the table, I have my girlfriend drink it before I will. Which since I don't gamble that I hadn't even thought about that, but, but that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. And so I have my girlfriend drink it. And she goes, why am I drinking this? Cause I do not want to relapse this way. Cause accidentally every they're, they're handing out, you know, alcohol. She's just got a big tray with right. a bunch of Cokes and beers and whatever it is. And on most it. people, let's be honest, they're getting free drinks there. So they're getting Jack and Coke or whatever. Well, that's pi- part of the allure of gambling is right. the free drinks. Yeah. And so I'm not down there for free drinks. I'm just want to kill some time and play some but you cards. don't want to accidentally pick up the wrong drink. Yeah. And yeah. so she drinks, she takes a drink. She says, nope, it's good. And yeah. that's the mindset I have. So I do precautionary things like that. Which so is it, smart. It really doesn't smart. happen. Yeah. You know, and then one of the times during the break, me and my girlfriend, we had, there's a Christmas party to bar. And this lately has been one of my favorite things to do. When you walk into a bar. <laughs> Josh, look at his smile. He, you he's walk really into a into bar this. and you do a podcast on addiction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of like the proverbial record scratch. <laughs> Everybody stops, gets a crooked neck, look at looks you. at me, yeah. looks back at their drinks, looks at their spouse, and they're like, what is going on? Yeah. Like they're going to witness something big. And I go, hey, look, guys, I'm human. I could. This is where the Christmas party is. I'm yeah. going to come here and it, it's okay. And I, you like fun. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but it's so much fun yeah. watching their faces. huh? Yeah. But I do want to run, share a story with you. Okay. So I'm driving around my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. My girlfriend texts me. She goes, Hey, the dry cleaners called. You got something with the dry cleaner, which seemed weird. Cause I don't have many clothes that need to be dry cleaned. Yeah. <laughs> but I do what a good boyfriend does. And I go, okay, I'll stop by there. Uh huh. So I pull into the dry cleaner, yeah. and this la- lovely l- young lady comes out. And I go, hey, my girlfriend says I've got some clothes here. And she goes, hold on a second. And so she goes back, and she gets her mom. And her mom and the daughter come to the window. Uh-huh. And they go, you don't actually have clothes here, but we wanted to give you something. Really? And I was oh. like, what? And she goes, yeah, we just want to tell you. Uh, we've got some family members battling addiction, and we've watched your story, and we listened to your podcast, wow. and you're such an inspiration to us. We we wanted to give you something. So they handed me over this little baggie. Wow. And then, uh, so I opened up the baggie. Yeah. And there was these two Christmas tree ornaments in there. Oh, wow. Let's see those. Hand them over. That uh, they had made. And one is oh, yeah, I can tell. Al-Anon, uh-huh. and the other is AA. Oh, that's great. So the yeah, you can tell these were these handmade. Were handmade, yeah. And so those are nice. I look back up at them and they're crying. Yeah. And then I start to cry. Yeah. So there I am in the drive up line at the dry cleaners, crying with my two new best friends. Yeah. Uh, sharing uh you know, the possibility of recovery. Yeah. And I thought, this is so beautiful. That and this is, is awesome. so wonderful. And so I went home and I told my kids and yeah. I said, Hey, look what these people did for me. 
Yeah. This is amazing. And my son's like, Dad, are we going to put it on the tree? And I was like, yes. Definitely. And so we put it on the tree. And so from now on, until as long as I have a Christmas tree, these Christmas tree ornaments will be up in there. That's beautiful. And it was a reminder of what a wonderful, beautiful recovery community we have here in Utah. We really do. Absolutely. And so much, in fact, that uh, it's an inspiration for all over the country. Yeah. Uh, a lot of our guests. Let me say to the dry cleaning family. Yeah. Thank you, not necessarily for thanking Casey, but for taking it outside your family, talking about it, pulling Casey in, thanking him, but being willing to share their experience instead of keeping it secret and private, which is what has always happened in decades past. Mm -hmm. And I feel like more and more is not happening anymore where people will say, even what they said, think about what they said. Like we have members of our family struggling with addiction that nobody would have said that in the past. No. Nobody would have announced that they have family members struggling with, they would have been ashamed and kept it private. But look at what the community is doing, and yeah. we're just happy to be part of that. But like the community is encouraging people where they feel safe and even appreciative enough of what the community is doing to say something. So good for them. That That's what we need is more of that ground roots you know, movement to get the word out. So if you need some dry cleaning in the Leighton or Kaysville area, yeah. phase dry cleaning. There you go. Is amazing. Good. Shout out. Um, it, 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 it is amazing. And I was telling you that, uh, you know, the Utah recovery community is an inspiration to other states. Mm -hmm. uh, I just recently found out through Facebook and Instagram that Ian Acker, he's mm -hmm. a, a good friend of ours. He's been on the been podcast. On the show. He was the creator and the inspiration behind Fit to Recover. Yeah. Uh, he's now passing the torch on and he's moving up to Seattle. Oh. And uh, I don't know what he's going to do up in Seattle, but we're still going to get a lot of our guests from Fit to Recover. Sure. Like today's guest, whose name is Nate. And Nate has been sober on and off since 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, but currently you're saying you're just coming up on 100 days of sobriety. About 100, 150 or so. 100, 150. And we want to talk about, you know, his journey and what it's like and what he's doing at Fit to Recover. Uh, and if you had to say one word to describe Ian, what would it be? He, he is a very, very encompassing human being. I'm very grateful for that because he does not judge and he takes anyone and everyone in. And that's what the recovery community does. We're going to hear Nate's story. You're listening to Project Recovery. Welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist, and our guest today is Nate Hazlett, uh, who's celebrating, is it 100, 150? Do you, are you one of those guys that know the exact days? No, no. You know, so I, I mean, I've, even when I was drinking beers, people yeah. would be like, drinkers don't count, counters don't drink. Because it used <laughs> to become this thing where it's like, I had 18 beers, I had 22 beers. You know what I mean? It was always a competition. Yeah. And so, and then when I got into recovery, people or some people are like, they know the exact day, they yeah, know the exact we, time. We have some people on the show that know it down to the minute. Like, I don't know what my days would be. Like, about every three or four months, I will Google September 3rd, 2018. Well, some people use an app, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, I don't You'll know. Google it to, to like do the math. You know, how many what? days has it oh, been gotcha. since September 3rd, 2018? Yeah. And it will tell me. That and seems. I, it seems I, unnecessary but, but I, every once in a while i like to do it i guess it. if you're proud of yourself yeah, yeah, you know good, what I mean? yeah. just to see how long it's been yeah so you don't know exactly how many days where does the story of nate hazlett begin well it begins up in uh, washington the seattle area where i grew up mm -hmm. and that's kind of where that's that's where i grew up in a little town about 30 minutes east of seattle called north bend now, so a small town, was it like a traditional small town? Not a lot going on, one stoplight, always green? Yep, it was the last last town you'd hit before you head over the pass to uh, eastern Washington. So it's not, not a whole lot going on, but traditional up until the last few years when they've been growing and whatnot. So what was your family life like growing up? Uh, brothers and sisters, religious family? Yeah, so I, I grew up in a very, I guess the beginning, very Catholic household. I had uh, two older brothers, some the youngest of three. And so, yeah, yeah, religion was very much a big part of my, my history growing up. And I went to a, a Catholic private school and middle school. Um, but yeah, growing up, it was a, a lot of my family is, is uh, among the, the sailor community. So that's kind of where that, that drinking originally comes from is just that side of my my family 
And so, uh, so drinking was prevalent at most family occasions. Oh, very much so. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. you go on a trip or a camping, uh, somebody was always in charge of the alcohol. Yep. Yep. We always had, always had that at least one or two coolers full of, full of booze at the family gatherings, family barbecues and whatnot. Now growing up, did your parents have a talk with you of saying, Hey, you know, don't drink or was there clear and concise rules? I mean, it was kind of that preconception of, uh, like addicts are the people on the side of the road who are, who are the homeless type and whatnot. And so that's that preconception I grew up with, but it wasn't until like my, my uncles and my family members really, like I, I got to a certain age where it started to be okay. And that's kind of where it, it rooted and took off from there. And so. Do you remember the first time you tried alcohol? Uh, I would have been in my, my single digit years, probably around seven or eight, just, just the dip in the wine and try that. And then, uh, I mean, it wasn't until I hit about 13 that I actually really got messed up for the first time and really got, got drunk. And I was like, Oh, this is a, this is an interesting feeling. And that's, that's out. We, we have some, uh, family cabins out in Idaho. And so when we're out there, that's really the culture is just drinking and enjoying the, the lake life and whatnot. So that's where it, it really rooted from. Now, being the youngest of three, did you uh, fit in with your siblings? Did you fit in with, you know, neighbors in your community? I mean, because we've had a lot of people on the podcast who, you know, um, felt like an outsider or suffered from anxiety, although they didn't realize that's what it was called. Mm-hmm. Or did you feel like you had a pretty good upbringing? You know, I, I would say I had a pretty good upbringing, but I, I grew up in an area where everyone around my age was either one to five years older than me. And so I was always just that sibling that people brought along. And I kind of identified more with my, my second oldest brother, his, his friend group rather than mine, because I didn't really have too many people around my, my age group in the area that I lived in. And we, we kind of lived outside of town next to the hiking trails and it was a beautiful area, but it was very secluded. And so it wasn't much of a availability to go into town, meet with friends and whatnot. So I, I definitely had that kind of outsider feeling growing up and at 13 you said you you, you got your first experience of getting messed up as you said mm-hmm. and d- you liked it oh yeah yeah it was a it was a very hooking feeling because a lot of people that first experience is a miserable experience mm-hmm. yeah you kind of hope it is for most people that age yeah but it's not always and you were like hooking feeling you use the term that's that's interesting so Mm -hmm. you felt like it got a hook in you that early that's an alcohol reference and a fishing reference huh Mm -hmm. both oh yeah (laughs) and could be another reference but we won't talk about that (laughs) Uh, (laughs) only from casey and so at 13 did did you take to drinking pretty quickly or was it just like special occasions or whenever you could get a hold it or whenever you felt like you was safe to do you know, there's, there's, uh, to a certain point of condoning it within my family. Um, as long as I'm around people that are of age and they're, they're the ones providing it. Like that's, that's to the point of, uh, yeah, like this is okay. And then once I got to the, the high school years, I'm like, oh, I fit right into these, these parties and whatnot that I'm going to. And so it just kind of felt natural for me to just sway that way and continue on that path where I started getting to a point of wanting to get more. And I didn't realize it at that age, but that's that's kind of the root of my addiction is just this is that 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 booze and that those drugs and whatnot are are creating that that false feeling that I'm really striving for. And so that's what originally was that that hook is like, oh, I feel happier, I feel feel good inside. And so going to those parties and whatnot, it just felt natural. It brought me back to that that first time I did it, that euphoric recall, and it was it was very interesting because I'm like, oh, I this is nothing to me. Whereas to a lot of people, this is maybe their first high school party where they're going out and they're drinking with friends and for their first experience with alcohol. Whereas this is my you're a seasoned seven, vet, seasoned vet at that point. Yeah. Now, did you have any problems with drugs and alcohol in high school to where your parents were concerned or had to sit you down and have a conversation? Uh, the most I would say would be. Uh, I mean, it, it didn't really become a problem on that front until I, I hit college because a lot of it was just hidden. It was behind the scenes. I was very good at living that two-faced lifestyle of being this kid on one side that's that's a straight-A student. I'm, I'm in the, the – I was associated with Young Life 2, a very Christian organization in the, the younger 
uh, high school, middle school age groups. And uh, on this other side, I was, I was going out and partying on the weekends and on Friday nights, that was my go-to. And so it was, um, yeah, it was really not known until I, I went to college and it started, people started seeing it for the first time. Now, at this point, is it just alcohol you're messing with, or was marijuana or other drugs introduced? So high school is when I, I got introduced to more of the drug side of the world, and it was uh, marijuana, it was opiates were a big favorite of mine. I, I got linked up with these people. I did running start in, in high school, so I was off at the community college for, for my last year, and that opens you up to a whole new spectrum of people. I'm going into Bellevue every every other day to go to school and making these new friends. And so I got linked up with a, uh, I didn't know at the time, but he was a drug dealer and he was one of my buddy's really good friends. And so um, he introduced me to opiates at a party one night and I just really took to them. So do you feel like that became your DOC? Uh, at that point in time, yeah, the opiates definitely were at the later years in high school. Do you feel like your DOC, and when we say DOC, it's a drug of choice. Do you feel like your DOC changed throughout your addiction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely has. It starts with alcohol, gets to more of the drug side. I was very much a big fan of marijuana. Um, then it gets to opiates, and then I start going back on that. But I, I definitely experienced more drugs in college. So it was the, the ecstasy, the cocaine, um, cocaine laced with fentanyl, all, all in, inclusive at that point. Yeah, sounds like college. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, fair point. I, and I think uh, for the most time, most or I, I to be fair, that that's not true. Most people don't are, aren't doing the harder drugs necessarily. And but I, I, there I disagree. Is definitely, I think a that's the element. Yeah, I, I mean, I that. think that's where a lot of people experiment. That that is. I think I think part, part and you can answer this, Nate. But a part of it is like being away from home having freedom for the first time, like you said, meeting a whole nother crowd of people. And it sounds like you were comfortable hanging out with older people because mm -hmm. that was your younger life experience with the older brothers and their friends. And so, you know, that probably felt kind of fun. And older people, when you're that age, are cool, right? Mm -hmm. At our age, they're not cool anymore. But like, at, <laughs> when, when you're a teenager, old, like people in their 20s seem so old and cool and yeah. interesting. And so you want to do what they're doing. And so, yeah, I could see how it's easy to fall into that. And especially if you, like you said, you didn't really have the insight yet that feeling happy was was something that you were feeling sort of a disingenuous version of happy, right? It was a mm -hmm. drug induced, alcohol induced happiness. So it was all fun, uh, probably until it wasn't. You said you got into uh, a little trouble in college or with the family or people started noticing your behavior a little bit more. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So when I, when I was in college, it was right about the time they started legalizing marijuana and whatnot. And I had, uh, the, n my family didn't really know about my drug usage outside of the marijuana up until I started going to rehabs. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was really just the, the alcohol and the weed that they took to. And they, it was interesting because they were more upset with the fact that I was using nicotine than, than weed because both of my parents have had their history with drugs and alcohol, but they're amongst those people that are able to just put it down whenever. And I yeah. was not. And I, I definitely, having that, that false feeling and whatnot uh, present itself to me when I was under the influence, really just, it, it was that, that drive to do it more. And it was my way to connect with people. And, and being disconnected from my family out of school, this was my way to, I guess, just find my people and find my crowd. And so, yeah, it wasn't until I started coming home because I was working a job still back at home while I was going to college. I was about two and a half hours away from, from home. Uh, so I'd come back on the weekends and then I would, I would again, in that, that mindset of being, being under the influence, I would forget things at home. And so they'd, they'd find it in the laundry or they'd find it in my bedroom. They'd be like, oh, what's this? And so mm -hmm. it wasn't really like a hard, hard, you need to stop this. And so I would just be more, more concise in concealing it. Yeah. You had mentioned that that's when you started going to rehabs, plural. Mm -hmm. uh, how many rehabs have you done in total? I've only done two, but I've done a couple stints at one up in uh, Washington. I didn't really hit those until I, I graduated college. And it was about a year after that I, I first started back in 21. So, so walk me to the point where you end up going to the first rehab. What led yeah. up to that? So for that one, it was, it was about the same time COVID hit. That had a really big influence on my... Um, 
both addiction and my career path and whatnot, I was in the middle of college and I was not able to do anything. I was at a flight school in the middle of Washington. And obviously you can't fly with other people in the, in the airplane if COVID's rampant and whatnot. And so we didn't have school and I was uh, back at home for that point in time. I had been laid off from my job because they were cutting, cutting down the staff for the COVID problem as well. And so for me, that, that whole period of time was just, uh, smoking a lot of weed and going for a lot of hikes with my dog. And, and you know, yeah. we, we talked about it because we did this podcast during COVID. Yeah. And we were talking about how weird this is going to be looking back after 10 years. And now I think we're starting to see some of what has happened and transpired yeah. during those COVID times. But it was a dark time for a lot of people yeah. uh, because they were stuck at home. Uh, the, you know, the five a o'clock of, drink became a 12 o'clock drink. Yeah, A, a lot of substance abuse uh, took off during COVID because people were either unemployed, they certainly were underemployed, they were under supervised. So even if you were working full time at home, nobody could see what was in your coffee mug, right? Yeah. That kind of thing. And I think there was a lot of um, uncertainty. Uh, yeah. A lot of depression about what, where the world is going. I think being around you always helped me feel a little more optimistic because Casey's like the, the ultimate optimist. <laughs> I'm a fairly optimistic guy too. So I don't think that ever got me down too badly, but man, it's, it was just such a social problem. And when we feel, I mean, it's, it's a dumb thing to say cause it's so basic, but human beings want to feel good. That's like, that's like the basis of a human being. You we, everything we do in some way or another is designed to feel good, yeah. even though it doesn't always work out that way. You and can't feel good all the time. You can't, you can't feel good all the time, but we want to. Yeah. And so, yeah, when you're stuck at home, underemployed, you don't have anything really to do. You're a little worried about your future flight schools on hold, things like that. It's easy to ramp up your substance abuse or we saw a lot with people, you know, overeating, gaining lots of weight during that time and, you know, just all sorts of things. So you're at home, COVID hit, you've lost your job, you're smoking a lot of weed, taking a lot of hikes with the dog. Mm -hmm. uh, did your family go, hey, uh, Nate, what's going on? Yeah, they, they definitely started questioning me there because I had some very, very different behavior than what I normally would have um, Luckily, that, that stint only lasted for that, that summer, that, that February to September. I was able to go back to school and kind of start trying to get my life back on track. I was able to finish up, graduate, and whatnot. But I was still carrying those addiction habits with me. But um, one of it, it's funny that you bring up the COVID part and a lot of people getting depressed and whatnot. I had a good friend in, in high school, or not in high school, in college, and he was, he was my drug dealer in college as well. Um, but we had come back, and he, he had stayed there. For COVID because he was working for the school and um, unfortunately he had committed suicide and that scared me enough to stay away from a lot of the hard drugs that I had normally done um, but I still continued on with the alcohol and the marijuana usage and so after after um, graduating college with my my associates I had a number of licenses and whatnot um, I had come back home and I didn't really have a pass set out for me so I just kind of joined the workforce and started doing that as a lot of physical labor jobs and whatnot. And that that's where, I mean, you hear a lot of, a lot of uh, addiction in those, that kind of industry of, of physical labor. And I was definitely one of those, those folks that took to it. You know, I, I mean, I, I, all through college, I worked in, in construction and mm -hmm. a lot of those guys are working for the weekend. You know what I mean? And your day starts uh, out hungover. There's and, a song about it. Yeah. Your day starts out hungover and you can't wait until five o'clock comes so you can sit on the back of a truck bed and drink a beer. I think, I think physically demanding jobs are are exactly that and you're exhausted at the end of the day and and people want to feel better a quick pick me up and so there's a lot of culture i mean you know probably in every level of society but you know it, it sort of makes sense again back to the idea i want to feel good i'm exhausted my muscles are sore i've been put working in a hard all day, day. Mm -hmm. and so people want to unwind and and uh yoga sounds like work but drinking doesn't so <laughs> And so you're, so you're working in the workforce, and you're, are you starting to drink a lot more? Yeah, so at this point, it's, it's the, I'm starting to leave the drugs behind, but that comes back later on, and I, I pick up a lot more drinking. And then that starts to affect my, my finances, and so I'm, I'm adding more jobs, I'm adding more hours worked, and I'm adding more drinking on top of that. So it's just a whole storm of, of a mess, and so 
at this point I start to get that, that mental depression set in of just like, I don't have a path. I don't know where I'm going with my life. I keep messing it up and I keep, I don't have this, this savings account that I keep saying I'm going to have. So I'm not able to fulfill that goal of mine. Um, and so I have this, this kind of mentality of an external uh, validation source that I need because of a lot of things growing up. It's, it's again, hits that two, two faced lifestyle and whatnot of always being this perfect person and just being myself in the party community. Um, and so I start looking for that external validation and I, I turn to relationships now for that. I, I link up with someone from, from my past in high school and we start dating and I kind of subside on the, the addiction side of it. I start drinking less. I'm still working two jobs and whatnot. But it wasn't until I get part, part the way through that relationship that I start picking up that addiction again because I'm, I'm realizing that external validation isn't enough and I need that, that internal feeling. So I'm drinking more, I start using weed again. Um, it's, it's very legal at that point in time and I am very of age at that point in time. So it's no, no hard way to get. And so, um, but that starts affecting that relationship. And so I'm thinking it's the relationship that's the problem, but it's not, it's my addiction the whole time. And I'm just sitting here trying to cope with life and the bad feelings that come with it. and being dig, continuing to dig that hole and whatnot. And uh, yeah, it, it, that's the point in time where I start to get to, uh, I start seeing a, a therapist. I start going to uh, inpatient rehabs and whatnot. And yeah, that was never enough. And that was always like, I was, as soon as I got to the point of getting pushed enough to talk about how I feel, I'm not. And I, I run from those two. Why? 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 Why didn't you want to talk about how you feel? Was it your upbringing? Was it insecurities? I mean, I'm, I'm curious. It's it's a number of them, and those those are definitely included. I mean, it was that I grew up in a very like you need to be a self sufficient person household. Um, you need to be able to provide and whatnot. And so I'm, I'm thinking in my head like, oh, I need to be this this owner of my feelings. I need to have all my 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 stuff together, and I need to be that person because I'm always so like, talking about feelings sort of indicated weakness or yeah it was never never really you know. touched touched as a as a kid i never was really emotionally in tune or anything like that uh never really addressed anytime i it was addressed it was always addressed in a negative way mm -hmm. i think that's common right i mean yeah because what he was describing is was life you know what i mean right you, you, mm -hmm. you know and 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 i and i've put it back on myself. And I was like, you know, I think we all find ourselves in that situation. And sure. we think everybody else has got it figured out, but little do we know they're all feeling the same way we are. Yeah. Or a lot of people are. A lot. Uh, well, for sure, everybody. Yeah. And, but we just don't talk about it. So you feel like you're the only one. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, my curiosity is going into these, um, you know, therapy sessions and, and support sessions. Did were you still trying to maintain the idea that it's external things that are the problem, the girlfriend or the job? Uh, were there thoughts starting to percolate in your mind, like maybe I'm doing something that I shouldn't do? Or or was your ego such that you were in those rooms and you were like, I'm not like you guys? Because <laughs> that's how I was. You yeah. know what I mean? I was like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bad. I'm, I'm not going to deny that I'm not in a bad shape, but I'm not as bad as you guys. You know what I mean? And, and I don't know if that was, and maybe that's not fair to say. You know, at first it was a, very much a lot of minimizing. It's, maybe it's a drug problem and not, not an alcohol problem. I can control it. And I was very much on that control spectrum of I, I need to control every aspect of my life. And so not being able to have that power over it really, really messed with my head. And so um, I got to a point of, of talking about those feelings and whatnot and uh, getting to a point of getting pushed enough where I'm just like, no, nah, I don't need you guys. I can handle it. And yeah. so I would, I would stay sober for a little bit and then I would go straight back to the bottle or go straight back to the joint because that's what would help me function. And that would get me out of my head, out of that mental, mental What did you problem. think about people that were talking about their feelings and being really open in those sessions? You know, at, at the point in time, I was very much like, you, you are very out of control of your life. Yeah. And you do not have the power to do anything about it. And I was very much putting myself on sort of a pedestal of like, no, I can handle it. I don't need to talk in a group of people about how I'm feeling or the, the, the stresses that I have going on in my life. Yeah. Like I can talk about the addiction and I understand that's probably a part of my life. But um, as far as going to that next step, I was very much stonewalling it. You know, it reminds me of a time that I was in rehab and 
we've well, heard you've heard this before, but the therapist goes, "Do you want me to blow your mind?" And I'm like, "Yeah, man, I'm in rehab. <laughs> drinking's not your problem." And I go, "Pretty sure drinking's my problem. That's why I'm here." And he goes, "No, your problems are your problems." And drinking was your solution, and now it's no longer helping you, and it has become a problem. Let's not get that twisted. But it was took me so long to realize that, and it's kind of what you know Nate is saying. Got to go right to here. that next level, like you Nate know what I mean. Yeah. Right now, he's like, "Well, the drugs are the problem, or the yeah. alcohol is the problem." No, not until we unpack that backpack or unpeel that onion and figure out what your problems are and what you're searching from, or what you're running from, or what it really is the issue. Right. That these are just here to, like you said earlier, make you feel good, yeah. and they do work, and they will make you feel good for a while, for a minute, and then. You got to go to the next level or you got to do this. And so you're always chasing that high to feel better. And mm-hmm. so until you unpack that backpack and figure out what really is the issue, because mm-hmm. I mean, the drugs and alcohol are an issue, but the reality is, is you had some issues. Mm-hmm. Did you ever get to the bottom of what those issues are? Are you still working on those? Oh, definitely still working on them. But one thing I understood in, uh, I guess my my first time in rehab, which which happened after that point in time of, I had uh, ended well, let's the just, relationship. Let's get yeah. to that. So most people have a rock bottom. Mm-hmm. What does your rock bottom look like? You know, I thought it was I thought it was that point of getting to rehab. Just before that, I had gotten to to such a deep point in my addiction. I was burning so many bridges with people, with companies that I work for and whatnot. Um, I got to just a point of uh, suicidal tendency. And so it, it got bad enough to a point where I tried to act on it and uh, it, it did not work for me. And I thought that was my rock bottom, but it wasn't. So I, I, um, my, my brother that lives in Oregon had uh, invited me to come down and live with them and just try to get me back on my feet. And that was a very good situation to be in. But as soon as being home, all those stresses of life come back on. I'm expected to act a certain way, abide by these rules. I need to get a job. I need to get back on that, that career path that I want to do. And it just all hit me being surrounded by family around the holidays and whatnot. It, it was, it was terrible. And I had relapsed within a couple of days of being home. And that was the point that I went to rehab and where I was, I was in with a bunch of people that had the same problem as me, but it wasn't until I met with the, the therapist and case manager there that he kind of explained the same situation that, that you just ex- explained of, it's not, it's not the drinking or the drugs that are the problem, but it's, that's just your way to cope with life's problems. Mm. And that's the real issue. So it wasn't until that point that I'm really like, oh, maybe I am an addict or an alcoholic and, and I'm just coping wrong with life stressors. It's, it, I mean, well, insight is the prerequisite to change, right? And so until a person, any of us, has true insight about ourselves or, or our life situation, we can't really make changes. You know, the changes are very temporary and, and insufficient. And so it sounds like that was a turning point for you. Mm-hmm. You know, but the era that we grew up, Dr. Matt, mm-hmm. everything was blamed on drugs and alcohol. And I'm not saying drugs and alcohol. but Rock and roll was in there. Yeah, and, and, and all of that. But it was always the drugs and alcohol. And nobody ever wanted to go, but what's behind the drugs and alcohol? Why is a person using Why is they right. using that? And, you know, we've had so many of these podcasts where people, have, you know, had suffered from anxiety, but we didn't call it anxiety back then. No. You know, and, and, and you know, other problems that, that they were running from or hiding from or numbing from. And, yeah. And, or or uh, one of the terms that I like a lot in therapy is underdeveloped. A lot of us grow up with skills that we need in life, but they're underdeveloped because maybe our parents had underdeveloped skills of communication or whatever it happened to be. And so we have to compensate for that. And and as people, we don't really always know the right way to go. And so we compensate in ways that can be self-destructive. Like if I'm if I feel underdeveloped in my ability to uh, make friends. If I don't really know how to do that, but I still have that strong drive as a teenager to make friends, then I might uh, find out that, oh, when I'm drinking or smoking weed, I'm I'm funny. People like me. So I'm always going to start using that in order to make friends because what I really want is a friend. Yeah. And so that connection, that connection. Right. And, and for teenagers, that's one of their biggest drives is social social connection, but a lot of teenagers don't know how, or they might have social anxiety. And so, yeah, there's, uh, I think a much better understanding now 
uh, that drugs and alcohol typically are being used for some other reason, and then eventually they become addictions. I think it's interesting, shocking, and sad that Nate talked about, he thought his rock bottom was an attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. But his real rock bottom came when he came back to his family and was overwhelmed with emotions and uncertainty and trying to figure out life. Back in that role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that shows you the power of connection, you Mm -hmm. know, and and, and I don't know your family, but I can only imagine it be someone like mine is they thought you were going to come back from your brother's and you did a control alt delete and everything's going to be fine. And then they're going to put you on this path and everything's going to be good, but nothing ever got addressed about why you were doing it. And so Mm -hmm. all those emotions flooded back at once. And sounds like you said, no, let's go to an impatient. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, uh, yeah, I found myself drinking the the next day that that morning, eight a.m. right after Christmas, and uh, yeah, that night ended up having a, a falling out with my family, and they kind of addressed me in in the way of like you you need help, and so I spent that whole night just uh, um, oh I've done I've done that just totally <laughs> totally just yakking and just having a bad time, and so my parents addressed me the next morning or the next evening. Um, cause I slept through the day and they're just like, Hey, so we've got, we've got a couple options for you. One of them is, uh, we can get you into a rehab facility. The other option is we got to figure something else out. So I'm like, well, I got nothing going for me, nothing to lose. So might as well go to this rehab. And little did I know they're like, all right, come downstairs. We've got someone on the phone. They got a bed for you. And that was my first intro to, to a real rehab. I had done IOP with this rehab prior to, but this is my first time inpatient. And so. Um, that's, that, that really is the story of my life about being that, that isolated figure and that, that alcohol being that, that, uh, oh, I'm the funny. It's that false, false confidence feeling Mm -hmm. that I get. And it's, it's where I felt I belonged and how to connect with people. I was always that outlier Mm -hmm. in any situation. And so, um, little did I know that's not my problem. And so addressing that in treatment was my first kind of step towards an actual active recovery of, you know, maybe I need to change some things in life. They call them the aha moments. Yeah. Where you're sitting in rehab and you're, oh, ah, yeah. <laughs> okay. that makes sense. You yeah. know what I mean? And I mean, I, w- I didn't go to rehab until I was 45. You know what I mean? Yeah. And to be 45 and figure out who you are and what you want or realize that you don't know who you are. I mean, it, it's an exciting, it's a sad, it's a frightening feeling to be all of a sudden like, Holy cow. But you know what? It is something that can happen to anybody at any age. And, you know, that old saying, you can't teach old dogs new tricks is not true. And so it really, in some ways, you're the age you are, so you might as well go for it. I love it when somebody goes, a leopard doesn't change your spots. I go, really? I got 300 episodes that shows you they do. Yeah. (laughs) We've got a lot of change spots on the show. You know, you like evidence? I got a ton of it. Yep. So how long did you spend in rehab? So that rehab was about a month, and it was inpatient um, up, up in up in Washington, Seattle area. And I spent about 30, 32 days inpatient, and then uh, I trans- transitioned into a transitional sober living facility. Mm-hmm. It was an independent house, and I was also doing IOP through that, that program as well. And I was very quick to get back on my feet, get a job, um, just get things rolling again, because that's my mentality of just, I, I got to be secure I have to be financially stable. Um, I have this path that I need to get back onto. Uh, and that, that was my problem was just, I, I, I didn't need to hit the ground running. I needed well, to take that time. I think it goes to back to what Dr. Matt said at the beginning of the podcast. And it's the same thing we talked about with relapse. You know, you're like, I'm out. Now I've got to get it all back. All at once. All at once. Mm-hmm. And then the first crack in the dam or the first sign that that might not happen, did you relapse? You know, it took me a little bit. It took me a little bit. I got mostly through through the IOP. I got to a good point where I had uh, been saving money enough to move out of the sober living place. I had a job that was very, very secure. It was paying me good money. And so, uh, but I was, I was not making time for myself in there. And so my answer was, okay, maybe it's just a place that I'm at, the IOP that I'm at. I was getting really frustrated with just the whole day in, day out. I'm going to the IOP talking about the same things. Um, I'm overworking myself. I'm not making time for that, that, that time to keep me sane. And so I moved out and that was my first hiccup was just moving out. I never reached out to the IOP facility because I still had X amount of time left in my IOP at that point. 
I was just going down to a different location. And so, but this one was just a lot closer to work and a lot closer to the place that I had now started renting. And uh, within a week of there, I'm just already back on that control spectrum. If I can control my drinking, one won't really hurt me. I just need kind of just an immediate just feeling dump and just that, that feeling back of just that euphoric recall of this feels good. And I just need a de-stress. How long did the hiccup last? Oh, that bottle was gone within the night. And it was, it was about a What's month. What's the lie you told yourself, one? Just one. Just one. And so, yeah, just one later, and it was a bottle later by the end of the night. And, uh, yeah, it starts I, – I, I continue to work for a little bit, but it starts getting in the way of my – work starts getting in the way of my drinking because I just can't handle the, the stress of life. And so um, – I stop showing up to work. It starts affecting me there and people start reaching out to me, questioning what's going on. And I just go total ghost mode on them and just disappear. Um, I'm just staying in my house. My, my parents start showing up at my, my place and like, we, you, you aren't answering our calls, what's going on. And at this point I'm just drinking daily from morning till night. And that's all I can do to function. And it's, it's just, I'm, I'm battling this internal feeling, but at that point in time, I didn't know it. Well, they say, you know, for an alcoholic, one is too many and a thousand's never enough. Mm -hmm. And once you get into that cycle, I mean, you're like, I'm just going to drink in the morning so I can get to the afternoon. And then you're like, well, I'm just going to drink tonight so I can get some sleep. And the next thing you know, it's months later. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it got about uh, two months later where I couldn't even stand up or walk without having a drink to be able to stop shaking and just to be able to function. And it was just maintenance at that point, but it was, it was very much a insane amount of alcohol to be drinking for maintenance. This is going to sound like a weird question because I know the answer, but for those listening, how much fun were you having? Oh, zero fun. <laughs> I was completely isolated in my, in my place. I did not go outside very much. I was, it, it was drinking took priority over sleep, over eating, over, uh, even just taking care of myself, basic necessities. And it was just a function and just be able to, to walk around, to be able to get up and go get food out of my fridge. It was, it was such a problem. Um, and it got to the point where my family started kind of imposing on my, my space and just, Hey, we're really worried about you because again, they, they got back to that. Well, I'm glad this isn't going to happen again, but they weren't necessarily aware. Like they had been told we had family groups in my rehab and whatnot. And, it increased our communication a lot about just the things I was dealing with, the things that they were going to be dealing with, they were going to be dealing with, but it, it didn't really address the fact that relapse is part of that recovery process. Right. And so, um, yeah, they're, they're coming in very, really concerned and, um, ended up getting the, the manager of the property to open up my door quite a few times for them to walk in and be like, Hey, what's going on? And it wasn't until a point where I had very much given up. I was, I was drinking myself to death at this point, um, just, just using to a point of oblivion. And uh, my parents had gotten in contact with a, a private addiction counselor. Interventionist and, type guy? Uh, she, was, she was more of just like a, um, if you don't want to go like the main route of talk, calling, calling addiction centers and whatnot um, and asking for a place, she would be the one to do that for you. But just um, you go through her, she sets it all up, and then you just show up at the, the airport or whatever place you go to. And so I got to a point of just giving up where I just I start responding to her because she had been reaching out for a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, you know, I'm not going anywhere in life, and I'm tired of this. I can't even sit up straight without shaking. And so uh, we, we start chatting on the phone, and uh, she starts telling me about all these places that I'm very familiar with in the, the addiction community up in Washington. And I was never really a fan of them because they only had really just like a one, one way street as far as this is the only way to get sober. Mm -hmm. And then she starts telling me about these other places uh, down here in Utah. And those kind of piqued my interest because it's, it's a lot of like, you're going to work with an individual therapist on a weekly basis. Whereas my prior rehab center, I met with one one time in the entire six months I was working with them. Um, they have um, occupational therapy. Uh, they have... Um, All kinds of different modalities. Yeah, rec, rec therapy was the big one that kind of took to me because I'm a very outdoorsy person. Yeah. And so I was like, you know, I've got nothing else here. I've lost my job. I'm not not really doing anything. I can't even pay for my my apartment at this point in time. And so um, I'm like, yeah, let's set it up. And so she sets, sets it up. And uh, 
yeah, I tried going to the, she's like, okay, next week or in a couple of days, you're going to be going to, to the airport. Uh, your, your mom's going to go with you. She's going to fly down there with you and someone's going to pick you up at the airport and drive you to rehab. I'm like, okay, let's do it. And, uh, we get to the airport and I'm still in that maintenance phase of drinking. My, my parents had come to the conclusion of like, yeah, he just needs this to function right now. Cause they started chatting with that, that therapist, yeah. that counselor enough where she started educating them a little bit more on addiction. The dangers of just stopping right now. Just stopping. Yeah. 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 I had, I had detoxed too many times just in their house with her taking care of me enough where she's like, I don't want to deal with this. We're just going to get you here. And so it pained her enough to see, but I'm, I'm sitting there in the airport, getting wheelchair through the airport. I'm having a drink at eight in the morning just to be able to get on that flight and uh, end up having a, a withdrawal seizure just because I had not had enough alcohol in that amount of time, have a withdrawal seizure in the middle of this restaurant in the morning and end up getting hospitalized for a couple of days. Um, but yeah, right after that, just spend the night at my parents' house after I'm well enough to get to the airport again, hop on that airplane and meet meet the person in the, the airport here in Utah. And that's where my recovery journey starts here in Utah. And so did you do an inpatient treatment center here in Utah? Yep. Yeah. So I went to uh, Recovery Ways and I did their, their residential program, their PHP program. I was, I was in their program for about 60 to 80 days. Um, but it was awesome because it was, um, I'm used to like a 60 person inpatient group up in Washington, whereas this one, like they, they cap it at 40 and it wasn't even at that point. So it was very well inclusive and it was, they, they had so much more to offer as far as just uh, therapies and ways for me to understand my addiction better. Is that when you were first introduced to Fit to Recover? Yes. So that's the, they, they have a relationship with Recovery Ways. And so I was going there when I was in residential for um, three days a week in the mornings. And it was, it was awesome because fitness is a huge part of my journey. Uh, one of my jobs back in Washington was a, I was working at a gym and um, it's always been a huge part of me as far as I've always wanted to be a trainer and whatnot. And uh, I, I was introduced to the kind of the classroom group of working out when I was down in Oregon with my brother because I was going to CrossFit every morning at 5 a.m. with my sister-in-law. And it was, I hated it at first, but I learned to love it because it's that community of people surrounding you and pushing you. Um, and it wasn't until I got to Recovery Ways in there that I finally understood what I was really missing in my life was that connection and that community of people around me. And I, I really felt that whenever I was going to FTR. And so I, I knew in my head that I had to do something with FTR because this is such a huge part of my recovery this time around. And I need that, that community in my life. So taking the steps to, to connect with the trainers there and continuing to go there, even through PHP, it's, it's been an awesome journey. And I'm, I, I feel like part of that family now that I'm a part of that company. That's amazing. So what I love about this is you, you had mentioned that, you know, your previous experience, there was like one way to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you've come to Utah. And fortunately, we do have a culture of many modalities of treatment recovery. And I feel like just like alcohol hooked you, you have to find the hook for your recovery too, right? People have to find what works for them. I think Casey, you've said it a hundred times, you know, there's what a million ways up silver mountain yeah and who cares what your modality is if you're a traditional 12-step person but if things like mindfulness meditation spirituality fitness. Uh, fitness nutrition any of these things that hooks you and helps you along your journey yeah i think that's we need the hook on the treatment side just like unfortunately we we can get hooked on the addiction side but i think he showed a great example of what we've said on the podcast all along the opposite of addiction is an abstinence it's connection and when you came down here and you found a group like ftr and you found that connection and you found your community and you found your tribe whatever you want to call it you found a place that you fit in Mm -hmm. that made sense to you. And then that's the key to, I think, for so many people's sobriety is something that makes sense to you, something that you're willing to do for the rest of your life. Yeah. There's so many people who get in, you know, the 12 steps. And, and look, I, I, I like the 12 step. I think it serves a good purpose. But I know in my head, I could not be for a some 12. some people, that's their community. Yeah. But it wasn't your no, community. No, it wasn't my community. And I'm not going to be going to meetings for the rest of my life. Right. I, I, that's not something that I want to do for the rest of my life. 
Well, I, I think you kind of know when you're hooked with something. Yeah. I mean, it's like when you meet somebody and you think they're really neat and, yeah. and you want to hang around with them again, like that, that feeling of you get hooked. Yeah. And I think addicts get hooked yeah. and in good ways or bad ways. Right. Mm-hmm. And so now you're actually working for FTR. Mm-hmm. What are you doing for them? I am a fitness trainer with them. So I teach treatment centers just like I was in recovery ways uh, coming there. Uh, they're now coming to me, and I'm I'm the instructor behind the uh, the thing you always wanted to do. The thing I always wanted to do, and it yeah. was it was interesting because um, I was I was telling I was sharing with with my my friends in rehab like oh this is what I want to do when I get out I want to I want to work at FTR I want to work in a fitness because I I really feel that connection there and I, I also want to work somewhere in the outdoor industry which I I also do um, up at the resort just so I can. Uh, pursue that that outdoor the occupational mm-hmm. side of it because one person really explained it to me really well her name is amy and she runs occupational therapy at recovery ways and it was just anything that occupies your time in your brain space and that's what really flipped the switch in my mind of mm. maybe recovery isn't just this one step journey this this 12 step journey but it's it's anything i do with my time to recharge myself mm. and keep myself sane and that that FTR fit very perfectly in there, and so being being a part of FTR now, it's it's awesome how full circle it goes because now one of my classes is actually that that recovery ways group, and I've taught that group that used to come in every morning that I was in, and now I can be the one to help them. Oh man, that is so cool! I love it. Yeah. So, how's the relationship with your parents and your brothers now? It's, it's been awesome since then. Ever since I first started in that rehab up in Washington, we've understood that our communication has always been off. But mm-hmm. it wasn't until um, they came down here to a family group, and I, I actually met with them and my, my therapist at that point in time, um, that we were able to sit down and fully communicate. And we've been working on communication the last couple of years since I've been in rehab. Um, but now, now we're able to actually communicate better as individuals to each other, it's it's nice, honestly, being having that distance between us, because it gives me a different sense of responsibility. That now I, I have this uh, control over my life, and it's it's under my instruction now, uh, versus being under this kind of umbrella of expectations. Uh, but not only that, but my goals have changed since the first time I was in rehab. Now it's it's less of a security, more of a a personal internal happiness that I strive for. And so that's completely changed the way I communicate with my family. Um, doing all the things that I do with my time now has been huge because they see me flourishing in this community down here, especially the FTR community, because I, I very much get fulfillment out of helping people along their journey through fitness. See, and I think it comes back full circle to what Dr. Matt started with the New Year's resolutions. Uh, life's about experiences and the journey. It's not so much about the absolute. And, right. Well, for me anyways. For I, I, I think that's the healthiest way to look at but, it. But, yeah. you know, it, it is. And, you know, that's what I tell my kids. Life's about experiences and the journey. And uh, there's going to be ups and downs the whole way. But just try to, to make the best out of it as you can. And, and I think you bring... When you do well, you bring people who are close to you along with you. Just like we say, addiction is a family disease. Recovery is a family solution, right? Like yes. our, when one person is in recovery, I think their whole family, close friends, at least have the opportunity to benefit and grow. It sounds like your family is better at communicating, and I would assume, therefore, in some important ways, closer as a family. Mm-hmm. Most definitely, and it's... It's interesting how how the uh, communication aspect and just the recovery aspect kind of spreads its roots through your friend and family group because I have very close friends of mine. Um, it's that that chosen family, mm-hmm. and now they they see the things that I've changed in the way I act now, and they start asking questions. And we get into conversation about oh, what's different? Maybe maybe that's something I should think about changing. And it's very awesome to get into conversation with them about that kind of stuff because it's not something the normal person would think about. But since you're in the the rehab community and in that recovery situation where you're meeting with those people, you're doing a lot of introversial kind of looking at. And so you're, you're really looking at yourself over time and, and just internal ways you, you cope with things, habits and whatnot. 
not normal people don't really get the chance to do that unless they're working with a therapist or they actually make time for that. But here you're in that constructive environment mm -hmm. and you're actually going judgment free it. zone. Exactly. And so you actually have that time to just take a step back and understand, Oh, this is how I react. Maybe I wasn't right at this. Maybe I need to change the way I act now. And then this, this will be the, the result of that is that living a happy, sober life. And I'm not having to cope with it the same ways that I, I was in the past. I love it. Well, Nate, I want to tell you, you got three more friends to add to your community. You got Josh, Matt, and myself. So thank you very much for stopping by and sharing your story today with Project Recovery. I'm sure it's going to help many out there. Uh, and those who forgot, Project Recovery is what, Dr. Matt? It's still, in 2024, a KSL podcast. I'm hooked. of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.